All right. Good morning, you guys. Or afternoon. I don't know. It's um, getting pretty crazy, isn't it? So um, just keep fighting the good fight. Stay with it. Um, do feel bad, but we'll uh, we'll get through it. All right. So, anyways, um, hopefully things aren't so bad that you're turning to some of these negative, addictive behaviors that we're going to learn about. But and um, we'll be talking about adding some positive addictions to our world. So. With that, um, chapter 12, Avoiding Addictions, I found an online edition of the chapter that is uh, colorized, so to speak. So um, you can see some of the objectives. We had them as well in our um, assignment here that we're going to fill in. So you can kind of go through that, risk factors for addictions, compare contrast, kind of like we do with alcohol, why kids use, why people uh, choose not to use alcohol. And then we'll talk about um, just the appropriate use of prescription meds at the very end. So with that, um, going back here, um, let's see if I can click on this. I did this last time and it was driving me crazy. All right, so avoiding addictions. So with that, when you go through your notes, um, you fill in this a little bit here as far as we know some of the, um, the negative things with drug abuse, 1,700 deaths. Uh, 700,000 assaults, almost 100,000 sexual attacks and rapes as far as, um, you know, some short-term and long-term consequences um, societally. So one thing about risky behaviors is um, your book talks about how these activities can also obviously affect these other areas of your health. And um, in your notes, I ask you to kind of flip-flop and try to develop a positive addiction, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, for me, uh, the wrestlers always kid me about burning out the Aerodyne bike for 45 minutes every morning or whatever it may be. Obviously the exercise endorphins, the dopamine, things like that. Most aren't going to say, Hey, you're, you're uh, addicted to this Aerodyne bike or whatever it is. Um, but if I was starting my morning with, you know, hitting a marijuana cigarette, you might say, Oh, that's not as good of, uh, a health choice, if that makes sense. So almost substitutions for different things that can kind of trigger that dopamine, uh, your brain's reward center and pathway. So that being said, um, one of them that is a little bit, uh, I remember with the quarantine, they talked about Potawatomi uh, Casino being one of the first places that, um, if I remember correctly, shut down on the quarantine. It was obviously kind of a melting pot if you've ever been down to that uh, casino in our area, it's, I mean, with a, from a gambling standpoint, you've got people, you know, college age through people in their maybe even 80s that are there, all different walks of life, ethnicities, racial background, things like that. So um, I think maybe one of the more eclectic uh, uh, areas you can go to as far as uh, people watching or whatever. I'm not a gambler myself, but obviously these triggers – College is kind of an area where you can see all of a sudden, you know, maybe sports gambling, um, cards, things like that. Um, being a student at UW Oshkosh, I never did that, but um, kids would run up and go to uh, Oneida Casino up in uh, Green Bay. And that was kind of a, a thing that some people would turn to on campus. And, you know, you're a college kid, you don't have any money, but maybe go and gamble, uh, you know, $6 on the quarter slots or something like that. But the, uh, the main thing we're looking at, in our notes is um, we're going to start looking at drug, uh, just drug abuse and drug usage. So marijuana is still, you'll see in your notes, the most widely used illicit drug on uh, college campuses. Uh, prescription opioid abuse is, um, you know, after that, particularly Adderall seems to be very popular on our college campuses. You go through this, how do you compare? You can see that in the last 30 days, um, you've got, um, you know, or, or overall, excuse me, misread this, about six in 10 college kids have never used illegal drugs. Uh, so we were looking at that last week with, um, you know, alcohol consumption, four in 10 are binge drinking. So a lot of kids pretty much go to alcohol and stop there from a societal standpoint. Um, you do have in the last 30 days though, about 13.8% say that they've uh, used an illicit drug. I never know what these types of things, because obviously with marijuana, with Illinois, uh, south of us legalizing it, we're at 10 states. 
So as far as, um, you know, what do they count here? They give you a little bit of a disclaimer, excluding alcohol, cigarettes, tobacco, uh, oh, and marijuana. So obviously they're not counting that then if I read the fine print here and their um, consensus. So not sure how that, uh, yeah, anyway, so two thirds here say that they've never used drugs. So they are in our book, obviously, um, you know, counting, uh, they're not counting smokeless tobacco and things like that. That um, So they're getting into more, I guess, obviously, uh, you know, schedule four type drugs. So bottom line is why students don't use drugs. You can see here, um, athletics, academics, um, you know, different things there. And then uh, why students do use, so you'll fill that in your notes. So um, genetics, family history, um, attitudes, behaviors, expectations, um, social norming, and these influences. So you can see, for example, marijuana use, I guess if we're back to that. Um, if you look here, never used on campus. So you know, you do have 59.5% uh, of men and 65% of women um, saying they've never used. And then obviously, you know, they've got actual use versus perception. And I love looking at things like this where, yeah, if your roommate's a pothead and his buddies are always coming over or her buddies and they're using, you have a tendency to think, oh my gosh, everybody's using this stuff. On the other hand, um, you know, that's classic social norming where, um, your world is very much influenced, like we learned last week, with uh, social contagion and those influences. So, um, but obviously, marijuana use is the um, most widely used psychoactive substance behind um, caffeine and alcohol. So, with and nicotine. So it's uh, fourth on the list. Um, but as far as you know, again, that border now with legalization and things like that. So with that. Um, Going through here, they get into some reasons why race, ethnicity. Um, there are, you know, some historical context there. So drugs and their effects. If you go back now to your notes, I think I got this here. This is kind of the definitions and why students use. I don't care what this looks like on your notes. If you want to, you know, just put sentence summaries in. If you want to make this a, you know, a three, four page document, Obviously, you were initially going to write this in freehand and not type it on your Chromebook and submit it to me. So with that, these definitions, though, drug, drug abuse, drug dependence, drug misuse, those are really good uh, starting points. And you can see here drug abuse, again, those pattern behaviors, negative consequences. Uh, drug dependence is, again, continuing to use um, in spite of you know whatever the natural consequences may be. And then uh, drug misuse. So again, taking a drug for a purpose or by a person other than that for which it was intended or not taking the recommended doses. So this would be, you know, a person, they maybe were supposed to take oxycodone for their knee surgery. They've got a few pills left over or Percocets, and now they're taking it for social recreational uses and their, um, you know, maybe even how they take it. They're crushing it, snorting it versus, you know, the time release 12 hour you know, type of thing with the shell on the uh, prescription pill. And then drug diversion is the transfer of medication from the individual whom it was prescribed to another person. So I alluded to like Adderall, someone who has ADHD, they've been diagnosed this, um, you know, whatever this, I want to say disorder because it's so prevalent, but, you know, this mental uh, health circumstance and they're, they're prescribed Adderall, which is a stimulant. And so thus, um, you know, given that to a friend for 10 bucks or whatever. So with that, um, this is huge too, as far as how we take drugs. So you got a couple IV examples, injection, and then intramuscular. So think of like maybe a shot of penicillin if you had a bad infection or an IV if you went in for some sort of medical thing into your vein. You Obviously, the biggie we think about is, um, you know, oral dosage, mainly alcohol pills, and then inhalation, which is, you know, sniffing, snorting, huffing, vaping, whatever we want to put into it. And then um, this would be more of a subcutaneous injection. So um, either a um, injection in the skin, so a shallow type of shot, if that makes sense, not all the way into the muscle or uh, absorption as well. So 
where the drug is absorbed through through the skin. So your book also gets into dosage and toxicity. This gets into a lot of like things with um, um, just dosing and um, different things there as far as, you know, um, tolerance and things like that. Toxicity is basically where it becomes poisonous to the body. So like going back to alcohol, obviously there's going to be a gray area there depending on tolerance and gender and size and muscle mass and things like that. But there is a point where alcohol is toxic. We term it alcohol poisoning, i.e. a person overdoses, they black out and they're in pretty dire straits. So some of these individual differences, drugs are fascinating where you can see as far as these variants of enzymes and how the body may react. I just remember I had knee surgery and I had a shot in my quad of morphine and it was three in the morning and I was in a lot of pain and all of a sudden I'm singing songs and I got some sleep and it was the day after my second ACL reconstruction on my left knee. And thus I would say probably three, four years later, my wife had a cesarean section with the delivery of our daughter and I encouraged her about the same time, like two in the morning after delivering a baby and being awake all day and people visiting you to take a um, shot of morphine. And they estimate about one to 2% of the population is morphine intolerant. So the opioids and that type of thing. So instead of falling asleep, being jovial and singing songs like your esteemed health teacher, when he had knee surgery, my wife went into uh, Mrs. Wersbicki had like the equivalent of what by all accounts, like 30 cups of coffee. And she was just, you know, a chatty catty and kind of anxious and a little bit of paranoia and wanting me to go down to the NICU and check on our daughter and all those things. So for me, the drug had a completely different effect than it did my wife. And so drugs are interesting as far as the chemicals and things like that. So it depends on Again, a lot of things with the setting. Um, again, a lot of this is is definitely not anecdotal. These are all things that I've read, but like the setting a person has when they're, for example, maybe taking a hallucinogen and, um, you know, what, what it can trigger in them and that type of thing as far as um, different interactions with drugs. So that multiplier synergistic effect where, you know, you're taking alcohol with that same said opioid and um, how it can intensify the effects, uh, the types of action. So again, you can see here just different things with the drug and that, um, you know, how it's, um, how it can be expected as far as, um, you know, what it, what it does to the person. And then obviously uh, these gender differences, traditionally men are more likely to become, um, you know, I hate to say illicit drug addicts and that type of thing, but there are definitely uh, certain drugs that um, men are more privy to. Um, obviously, then there's certain drugs that, you know, we're seeing more of a catch up with women as far as heroin usage or things like that. So with that, these are some different um, definitions that are in your notes. Uh, if I go back here to... Um, you can see just some of these things to, uh, to, to write in. So now we're on caffeine. 80% of Americans drink coffee. Uh, the average is 3.5 cups a day. So, um, you know, what does that look like as far as caffeine? I was really, uh, I was probably drinking a Starbucks, to be honest with you. I was at Barnes & Noble years ago and reading about uh, Has America. I think it was a caffeinated society and a big picture of coffee on the front and Obviously, this is really, um, it maybe hits historical when you think about coffee and, um, you know, people drinking this even in like the Civil War era and that type of thing. And so you can see again, uh, 100 to 150 milligrams of caffeine per cup, a stimulant relieves drowsiness, um, its impact on the heart, some serious health risks. So, and you can drink, it says here, up to six cups of coffee per day in their studies without a reduction in, um, you know, cardiovascular health, health, but caffeine's one that honestly, if you think about it, it's always, um, you know, going to be a little bit controversial where you, uh, again, you know, it helps delay Parkinson's and you read something else and it's, if you're doing too much, blah, blah, blah. We're winding it down here, but again, medicine,